Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another session of the live webinar series by the Clean Energy Business Council. My name is uh, Raed Bikirat. I'm a senior advisor at CEBC, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's webinar. Uh, the topic for today, we will be looking at the uh, the impact of different scenarios for electric vehicle deployment in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia from the perspective of the carbon footprint associated with the energy mix that the Kingdom has embarked on. Now, uh, before we start, if you allow me, I would like just to go through a couple of slides to refresh your memory and give you some overview of CBC and the activities that we are doing before we dig deep into our today's seminar. One minute, please. Yeah, wrong slide. The Clean Energy Business Council is an organization, it's a non for profit organization that has really been around for about seven years. Uh, really, it's pretty much the oldest entity in the region that is looking at uh, building the clean energy sector uh, across the region. Um, the organization um, has about seven or eight years old. It's a not-for-profit registered in Mazdar, and it basically looks at linking the, uh, the private and the governmental sector, establishing a dialogue, a bridge, if you will, between the two uh, sides, which are very important for building a healthy market in clean energy. And one of the main areas that we focus on in CBC is the regulation and policy, because as you know, for the uh, clean energy sector in general, uh, without any clear uh, regulatory framework and policy framework, it's really difficult to kickstart a healthy and sustainable uh, market. Now, in terms of um, activities, uh, CBC really conducts, uh, try to deliver its message uh, through different venues. We, we, we conduct events uh, such as today's webinar, and we also uh, try to create dialogue between the private and public sector uh, through advocacy and thought leadership in different sectors. And we do this by hosting workshops, events. Uh, we do uh, white papers, market surveys, case studies. And we also have a very important aspect or element of CBC, which what we call working groups, which I will talk about in a minute. And we also have active programs, namely one on women in clean energy and one on schools. So in terms of the work stream structure, we have uh, mainly three active working groups. One is sustainable climate finance. A second one looking at energy efficiency. And we have a working group looking at uh, future mobility. In terms of programs, we have two programs. One is WISE, Women or Women in Clean Energy, and one uh, focuses on schools. We are proud, obviously, of our membership portfolio. Uh, we have over 120 members and um, whom without their contribution, uh, today's webinar actually wouldn't be possible. Uh, and we appreciate uh, their engagement and their uh, efforts to build a sustainable and clean energy sector across the region. And we also have relationships, obviously, you have to build the, uh, the bridge between the private and the public sector. We have relationships with several government entities, uh, such as the Supreme Council of Energy, IRENA, RECRI, and others. Now, um, today's webinar really comes part of the Future Mobility Club, uh, FMC. And just to give a brief overview of FMC, uh, the mission of FMC is really to support the transition of the automotive industry in the UAE and the MENA region towards green and smart mobility. The initiative started roughly two years ago, and it has uh, really key stakeholders, key members, uh, Schneider, NG, Green Parking, really active players but uh, are keen on the mobility sector and the future of the mobility sector in the region. And two main objectives for FMC. One is obviously infrastructure regulations, which is a sector that is somewhat lacking as we consider the deployment of electric vehicles, for example, in the region, 
And the second one, which is very much needed, really market awareness, looking at the value of adopting electric vehicles, the economics of electric vehicles, and the impact from different perspectives. Also, um, part of what we do, obviously, is we gather a lot of market data that help us really build the uh, right discussion topics, if you will, between the private and the public sector. And we have an ongoing EV infrastructure survey which takes a couple of minutes really to fill out with the objective to understand the potential of the market between the different uh, stakeholders, businesses and authorities in the UAE. And I think Ahmed, who's uh, driving this webinar, will post the, uh, the link to the, to the survey and would appreciate it if you have time to fill it out. And our next uh, live webinar would be on July 15th, uh, looking at women in clean energy and Canada's women in renewable energy, WISE meeting WIRE on July 15th, and we are welcome to join us for that. And of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to connect with any of us. Uh, Ahmed, who is uh, the engine uh, really behind CBC, we all appreciate it and thank him for his efforts. And we're looking forward to seeing you as a member and part of our activities. Now, today's uh, webinar, before we dive into the webinar, and I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Amr Shurafa, but before we do that, uh, maybe we can take time to do one poll, Ahmed. Do I need to stop sharing my screen or you can? It's fine, it's already on. It's fine, it's already on. Okay. Please let me know when we, uh, when we can continue. Yeah, I think I can close. Now it's important to note that we will be having um, time for question and answer towards the end of the webinar. And we'll probably ask you for a couple of more uh, quick poll questions. Now, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Amro Shurafa. I had personally the pleasure of knowing Dr. Amro for the past 10 years or so. And he's truly uh, an excellent example from a career standpoint. I've known Dr. Shurafa when he was, uh, or he still is, a scientist, engineer, PhD in electrical engineering. And he managed really to cross both sides of the aisle, now being uh, a research fellow at CAPSAR, looking at economics, strategy, and uh, looking at the general energy mix in the kingdom, interest areas span from the renewables to uh, looking at supply chain, the impact of uh, different scenarios on the energy mix. Um, Dr. Amro, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, before we start, maybe you can, I like your, your introduction, um, maybe we can talk about the motivation of the work. What is the motivation initially to look into this topic and what is the objective that you're trying to achieve? Please go ahead, the mic. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raid, for the kind introduction. Uh, very happy to be part, uh, participating in this webinar, uh, jointly hosted by CEBC and um, uh, CAPSARC. I'd also like to thank Ahmed for all uh, his efforts. Um, the, the motivation uh, came from our interaction with local stakeholders. Uh, the question of uh, do EVs reduce emissions or increase emissions has been uh, asked repeatedly. Uh, there was little uh, theoretical analysis to back uh, the claims. So um, generally, as we uh, usually do uh, in CAPSARC, we try to be uh, timely and relevant. Uh, so we uh, uh, took this research undertaking uh, to answer the question uh, and making sure that we uh, be as objective as possible and rely on uh, scientific fact-based research. So, uh, yes. 
So, uh, so I, I assume I, I'll start the uh, presentation. Um, uh, yes, please. All right. Thank, uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, very interesting to see um, uh, a wide, a large number of audience coming from different uh, sectors. I see um, uh, uh, energy experts. I see EV experts, marketing experts, business development experts. Um, uh, it's, it's always a challenge to, uh, to present to an audience with such uh, diverse backgrounds. I, I promise that I will try to be as interesting as possible and uh, I uh, hope that you will um, come out from this presentation with, uh, with a few uh, insightful uh, nuggets that uh, would help you. Uh, otherwise, I, I will consider myself to have failed as uh, a presenter. So as uh, Dr. Raid mentioned, uh, we'll be discussing uh, how do EVs impact carbon emissions uh, in Saudi uh, Arabia. Uh, before I begin, let me just uh, uh, very quickly um, uh, give a very brief uh, preview of, of CAPSARC for those who uh, might not be familiar. Uh, so CAPSARC is a, is a research center uh, located in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we are an independent uh, think tank. Uh, by independent, I mean we are financially independent and we are also independent in terms of governance. So we are managed by uh, a board and the board is chaired uh, by His Royal Highness uh, Prince Abdelaziz bin Salman, the energy minister. Um, uh, the name might be a bit deceiving. Uh, so King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center. Uh, our research is not limited to petroleum. We conduct research in uh, renewables, transportation, uh, uh, energy policy, uh, the geopolitics of, of energy, uh, climate change, sustainability, etc. Uh, the, the name might also be deceiving in terms of the type of research we conduct. Uh, we do not, we do not uh, undertake engineering research, so we, we don't have labs. Uh, we don't do physical sciences uh, in, in our research, so we focus on policy and economics. Uh, a reasonably big team, uh, 70 researchers, uh, full-time researchers with several uh, visiting researchers coming from around 20 countries. And um, uh, I'd, I'd really like, there's so much to highlight, uh, but it, I'd like to highlight one um, sort of deliverable, one interesting thing that we do at CAPSARC, which is our da data portal. Uh, we have a, a, a very good data portal that has thousands of data sets, uh, free uh, to download, free to use. Uh, they span uh, data related to electricity prices, solar installations, coal consumption. Um, uh, I mean, basically the, the whole energy landscape, both domestically, regionally, and also beyond uh, globally. So um, I encourage uh, everybody in the audience to... Um, consider CAPSARC as a uh, stop for your data needs. Uh, the data is exportable uh, in Excel format, is exportable to CSV, really nice, and a very intuitive uh, graphical user interface that can allow you to look at the data rather quickly. So I, I advise everybody to take a look at our uh, data portal. And of course, our website is capsarc.org. So without further ado, let's uh, dive into what we uh, want to, to discuss. Um, I, very briefly, I just want to set the tone. Um, countries have um, promoted EVs for several uh, reasons. Of course, in, in some cases, it is uh, more cost effective compared to an uh, internal combustion engine vehicle, an ICE vehicle, not always, sometimes. Of course, uh, there is potential to lower emissions. And um, even if the uh, net emissions are going to be uh, the same, you do benefit from uh, you know, moving away uh, the exhaust gases from city centers, uh, so that and that results in our third, uh, basically, advantage, which which is health health uh, benefits. So it's always in, in city centers where there's congestion. If if EVs are dominating there, that that also has values, even if the net emissions are the same. And of course, for countries that import their gasoline, that can contribute to their energy uh, security. On the other side of the spectrum, of course, uh, in some. Uh, jurisdictions, uh, EVs may be more cost effective and others, there's still uh, the financial aspect is still a concern. Lack of infrastructure, obviously, not all countries are still uh, are, are prepared to um, uh, absorb uh, EVs into their uh, transportation sector. A range anxiety, again, this is, some, this is something that stems from the lack of infrastructure and uh, the relatively long charging times compared to ICE vehicles. 
Um, yes, there are uh, high power charging uh, initiatives, the, the Kadimo, the, again, the charging power is reaching 50 kilowatts, uh, 50 kilowatts and even more, but not yet uh, fully ubiquitous because they need some, they require some uh, special cooling uh, mechanisms. So uh, uh, the, the, with that, uh, the research question that we tried to, to, to answer is, it's a very simple question, well-defined, uh, very well defined boundaries. It, it's as simple as do EVs reduce emissions in, in, in the kingdom? Um, um, to, to put that in per perspective, um, so the, the passenger transport sector in the kingdom emits around 75 million tons of, of carbon dioxide. If some of these um, ICE vehicles are replaced with EVs, of course, you expect the emissions from the transportation sector to go down. So this is uh, from the transportation sector side. At the power sector, the, the, the bottom left uh, figure, of course, you need energy to charge uh, the, the EVs. Of course, additional energy would uh, result in an increase in emissions. Uh, so the, the power sector in Saudi Arabia emits around 250 million tons. So it's, it's really a simple calculation. We want to quantify what would the reduction from the transportation sector be what is the emission reduction potential in the transportation sector and what is the emission increase in the power sector and we want to compare both v very simple uh, however despite the simple uh, question it, it did uh, require uh, some substantial uh, quantification and, uh, and uh, analysis uh, I, I, I hate to disappoint uh, the audience I know that uh, these topics that I have uh, in front of me now, infrastructure concerns, uh, subsidies for gasoline and electricity, is the distribution network prepared to uh, accept EVs? We are not going to be discussing that. I'm not in any way saying that these questions are not important. On the contrary, they're incredibly important questions, but the uh, uh, research undertaking that was uh, conducted here was related to emissions. And again, uh, to be clear as well, we're not doing a life cycle analysis. We're only worried about the emissions that are concerned with EVs on the road. Um, so, so with this research question identified, very simple, very well-defined boundaries, how do EVs impact uh, carbon emissions? Uh, you need to um, find several answers to, to several questions, sub-questions. So uh, driving patterns, when the EV is deployed, how will the owner drive it? Is he going to be driving it mostly for highway driving or for shorter distances? Um, what are the efficiencies of the EVs deployed and what are the efficiencies of the ICE vehicles that are retired? So if somebody's driving an eight cylinder SUV and replacing it with a specific EV, uh, the retirement of the uh, ICE is going to vary between a four-cylinder car and an eight-cylinder car. Of course, you will have different impacts. Uh, the substitution effect, uh, will the owner of the new EV vehicle drive his EV all the time, uh, drive it most of the time, drive it 25% of the time? So this as well is an issue. And of course, when is he going to charge, it, to charge his EVs? Is he going to be charging it during daytime, uh, early evenings, afternoon? So, et cetera, of course. And these are not all the factors that need to be considered, there are others. Um, so when, when we looked at the literature, you literally find in many cases, each one of these factors uh, as a dedicated research study uh, with stochasticity, with uh, random variables, with probabilistic theory used, statistical theory. So uh, we, we didn't want uh, our efforts to be derailed. We wanted to focus on emissions. We didn't want to exert that much effort in this topic. I'm not saying it's not important, but it's not necessarily exactly related to what we are interested in. So we thought, okay, let's, let's uh, circumvent this, let's surmount this obstacle by the following. Let's think of extreme cases. Let's think of the best case scenarios and the worst case scenarios. Let's try to eliminate all the possibilities and the combinations and just think of the limits. How, so how did we translate that? So how did we translate this qualitative thought to, to an actual numerical assumption? So we said, well, in the best case scenario, we want all the eight cylinder cars, all the SUVs, all the non-efficient ICE vehicles to be retired. 
and be replaced with the most efficient EVs, you know, those EVs that require 0.10 kilowatt hours or 0.09 kilowatt hours a kilometer. So this would be the best case scenario. At the other extreme, the worst case scenario would be, you know, retiring all of the small four-cylinder cars, the small, very efficient ICE uh, vehicles, and replacing them with the least efficient vehicles. Uh, so so th these, these are two extremes in terms of the cars retired and the cars and the EVs uh, deployed. Another extreme uh, uh, is related to the power sector. So let us restrict all the charging to be only happening during peak hours. And at the other extreme as well, at the other side of the spectrum, let us restrict the charging to off-peak hours. So again, as you can see, we're just trying to find the extremes. We're trying to find the best case scenario and the worst case scenario. And every other scenario you want to think about basically is going to be contained within these uh, two extremes. And of course, to, to simplify uh, the analysis, we assume that the EV deployment is going to uh, be perfectly replacing uh, the ICE vehicle. So if you drive 20,000 kilometers a year using your ICE vehicles, you will replace these uh, fully with EVs. So there will be no ICE vehicle uh, driving. So uh, let me uh, go a little bit into details. Um, sometimes you speak to EV experts and uh, they don't necessarily um, uh, have the same appreciation as, as power experts. And, and I'm just trying to bring both uh, sort of sides to, 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 the, to the negotiating table. Um, so this is a conceptual in front of you. I, I, I hope it's clear. Um, uh, this is a conceptual base load uh, in the gray region. So the gray shaded area is a conceptual base load for uh, a power utility before any EVs are introduced into the system. Um, uh, so in the yellow region, uh, this is the additional energy that should be supplied by the utility uh, to cater for the EVs that are deployed. Of course, when you deploy EVs, you would need to charge them. And we assume, as we explained in the previous couple of slides, that we want extreme cases. So let's restrict, in one of the scenarios, all the charging to happening in the peak hours, you know, between 8 and 1, between 9 and 2, where, you know, everybody's, uh, they have their ACs on and everybody's at work. So this is one extreme scenario. The other extreme scenario, an additional load could be also, uh, as, as an extreme, the, uh, charging would take place during off-peak hours, as shown in the blue region. So off-peak hours would be, you know, late in the evening. And, of course, you have a whole a set of random cases, which is depicted in green. Uh, so, of course, if you deploy 10,000 cars, at any point in time, a car can be charged. At any point in time, uh, you, you can the owner of the car can choose to, to uh, uh, charge the batteries to be half full or three quarters full or fully charged. So countless uh, combinations. Uh, but what we're going to be focusing on is the peak charging period and the off peaking charge, uh, the off peak charging period. And with that, as I said, we uh, basically uh, quantify the best case scenario and the least case scenario. Now, um, I apologize, I, I'm probably going into some detail, but I think this is extremely important. Uh, I generally uh, ask this question and I don't necessarily get an answer, and, but I think it's very important because not knowing how the emissions were quantified can really skew your, um, uh, your results. So uh, let's look on, on, on the left side. This is a hypothetical power system uh, comprising two technologies a nuclear technology, which is carbon-free, and a fossil fuel technology. Now, as you all know, the nuclear technology is not a technology that is used for ramping. So you can't really ramp a nuclear reactor, you know, up and down rather quickly to follow the load. So generally, nuclear uh, power plants would satisfy your base load. The fossil fuel, being a little more flexible, would follow the load. And uh, believe me when I say that both areas are equal, they're exact. So let's assume that the nuclear meets one kilowatt hour of uh, load and the fossil fuel also meets one kilowatt hour of load. So both of them meet exactly 50% of the load. Now, the, the fossil fuel, let's assume that it um, um, emits one kilogram of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So here on the left side, we have one kilogram of CO2 emitted 
and two kilowatt hours of energy generated. So my average emission, my average emission for this system, for this hypothetical system, is half a kilogram of CO2. Let's go to the right side and let's see what actually happens. So both uh, uh, dispatching, both uh, figures are identical, except for this blue region, this blue shaded region. This blue shaded region is the additional energy that the grid needs to satisfy when EVs are deployed. Now, notice if an additional kilowatt hour is needed, if one kilowatt hour additionally is needed, based on the average emission method, well, we will do our calculations and we will come up or we will arrive at an additional half kilogram of CO2 emitted. However, if you look closely, you will find that the fossil generator is the generator that is satisfying all the incremental load. Nuclear is not contributing to the incremental load. It's the fossil fuel generator contributing to the additional load, which means that the additional kilowatt hour, because the emission rate of this fossil generator is one kilogram of CO2 per kilowatt hour, the additional kilowatt hour will result in an additional kilogram, not half a kilogram. So as you can see, there's, there, there's, you have to be careful of what is the method that you're using in, in quantifying your emissions. Of course, the average emission method is quick and easy, and it's suitable for high-level studies. However, uh, in the greenhouse uh, gas protocol, uh, they explicitly mention that it is the marginal emission method that needs to be used, not the average emission method. And for the purposes of this paper, because we want it to be as accurate as possible, we have opted to use uh, the marginal method. Of course, it does require additional data and additional modeling, so it does cost you this additional accuracy is, is uh, costly. So with that, uh, how did we, uh, now that we've uh, explained the qualitative um, aspect of the paper, how did we do, dig down and actually achieve the numerical results? Uh, the, the model was created uh, via a, um, a commercially available software called Plexus. Uh, I'm sure many of you are, are uh, familiar with it. It's, it's a commercially available software that allows you to perform uh, reasonably accurate uh, uh, analyses and studies for the power sector. Of course, we built the model and calibrated it for 2017. Uh, I know we're three years late. Uh, this is generally the nature of, of power modeling. You know, you always have the data of last year and then you need a year to do the modeling analysis. And by the time it's published, it's already uh, two years old. Uh, but, but in any case, the results still uh, would still be considered insightful and, and valuable in a way. Of course, so we have capacities of the generators, heat rates of the generators, uh, transmission capacities, losses, etc. And uh, for the deployment, of course, if you wanted to do the proper analysis, you had to go through a survey and you had to know uh, the income uh, of those who want to buy EVs, etc. But of course, that's just going to be a very big undertaking. To uh, make things a little easier, we assumed that the deployment of EVs is going to follow the population, uh, basically, percentage, the population distribution within the kingdom. So, for example, as you can see on the right, if the um, population uh, in the eastern region is 18% of uh, the, the total population of the kingdom, we assume an 18% deployment uh, of uh, EVs to be concentrated in the eastern uh, region. So uh, a summary of the scenarios. So as, as I explained, we assumed uh, uh, charging happening during the peak, charging happening during off-peak, and a scenario just to um, represent a random case. And for example, in terms of our best cases and uh, uh, worst case scenarios for the replacement of ICE vehicles and EVs, we assumed a least efficient vehicle, you know, the, as I said, the eight-cylinder SUVs being replaced by the most efficient EVs and vice uh, versa. And of course, there you will find yeah, uh, you, the uh, 0.15 liters per kilometer, for example, for a least efficient vehicle. Yes, of course, it could be 0.14 or 0.16, but nonetheless, the, the main uh, um, messages from the, from the analysis would still be uh, applicable. Now, uh, th there... Again, let, let, qualitatively now, if we look at what are the possible outcomes, so before running any models and before running any scenarios and simulations, uh, we, we sat down and said, okay, so we have a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. 
So that's two combinations here or two possibilities. And the output might be, well, you either end up with an increase in net emissions or a decrease in net emissions. So basically you will have you know, a worst case scenario and a, and a uh, best case scenario and an increase in emissions and a decrease in emissions. So that's four possible combinations. Um, so we'll just say, so there are four possible combinations. And I'll just explain in a minute why there are three logical ones. The most desired outcome is for both scenarios, your best case and your worst case, to result in a net decrease in emissions. That, that's the, the, the most desired outcome that any country would like. However, another possible outcome would be, you know, whether you uh, take off the road your least efficient ICE vehicles or the most efficient, irrespective of what you do, you know, both extreme cases will result in uh, an increase in emissions. This is something that's least desire desirable. And of course, the, the, the illogical or the not possible um, uh, option is basically to have an increase in emissions in your best case scenario and a decrease in net emissions in your worst case scenario. And of course, that's just not logical. You have the in-between, the, the, the scenario where, well, it is possible that if at the best case, you can get an e a decrease in net emissions. But if you're not careful, uh, at the worst case, you can actually end up with an increase in net emissions. And um, of course, uh, you, you probably guessed, uh, generally, uh, countries where uh, the... Um, uh, energy mix is, is mainly dependent on liquids or fossil fuels or maybe uh, not uh, relying on two uh, on, on renewables, for example, you could probably think that you, you may be ending up in uh, outcome number two. And as expected, uh, we find that uh, the kingdom uh, at the best case uh, will end up in a, 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 a reduction in net emissions in the uh, transportation sector, in the passenger transportation sector. But at the worst case, it is possible that the or the, the emissions will increase. And of course, uh, the average will be somewhere in the middle. Now, the, the numbers are not what I want you to remember in, in the slide. I, I, what, what I think was interesting about this study, the simple idea of considering both extremes, what would be the best case scenario and what would be the um, uh, worst case scenario. And if, you know, it, it's very telling, it's very insightful if you end up with a result uh, where the analysis shows that both cases are resulting in a net increase or a net decrease. This in itself is, is something insightful. And, you know, uh, as I said, uh, on average, the, the um, deployment of, EVs, of EVs in the kingdom will result in a decrease in emissions for passenger transport. Uh, with that, this is my last slide and um, three takeaways, if, if, um, if you want to remember the most important takeaways or nuggets from this presentation. Uh, so basically, if you replace ICE vehicles with EVs, you will end up with a reduction in emissions. Now, you'll find that I have um, grayed out the numbers. Uh, I don't want you to remember any numbers uh, because these numbers... Uh, as you all know, uh, those who have been involved in modeling, you know, uh, you change transmission losses of the power sector. If you change the deployment, the ratios of, of the EVs between the regions, uh, emission factors uh, also vary by a few percent between different uh, reports. Uh, the number of cars that uh, the passenger transportation in the kingdom is not known exactly, so you have to do some, some assumptions there. So this 1% or 0.5% or 0.3%, you know, it can change by changing your assumptions. So uh, what I want basically to, to uh, um, uh, come across is the, the emissions will decrease. However, you have to be uh, careful how you do it. And of course, we're, this is 2017, so the, the results will definitely be a little different now that we are in 2020. Uh, number the the second takeaway is basically stems from the first one, which is you can if you're not careful, uh, the emissions uh, net emissions will actually increase rather than uh, decrease. Finally, uh, we found from our analysis and from our modeling that um, the time of charging does not significantly impact uh, emissions. And uh, one insightful uh, finding that uh, I will share with you is that many um, who discuss EVs, of course, recommend that, you know, it's, it's always um, advisable for the grid, 
uh, to be satisfying energy for EVs during off-peak hours. You know, generally in, in off-peak hours you have your efficient generators, and during peak hours you have your in, you have your expensive inefficient generators. And generally that's true. But I'll just share one uh, insight from the model. Um, in some of the cases in the central region, we were seeing that the emissions or net emissions were actually uh, decreasing. Uh, a little bit counterintuitive, especially that we were restricting the charging to the peak hours. And so after looking into the results, after looking at the capacities and the uh, energy transmission between the regions, we, we realized that, um, that in many cases, uh, the load in the central region is higher than the generation capacity available in the central region. So the, in, in many cases, the load is higher than the generation capacity available in the central region. So the, the eastern region during these times shoulder the deficit and um, uh, the, the eastern region is, is dependent or is, is uh, primarily fueled by natural gas, which is efficient. So the, the efficient gas supplies or satisfies this incremental kilowatt hour, which results uh, in, in, in a decrease in emissions compared to uh, liquid uh, fuels. Uh, with that, I, I think I've, I conclude my presentation and I hope it was um, insightful and uh, I would welcome any uh, questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amrud. Very impressive presentation. And as expected, I'm looking at the questions. There's a lot of uh, feedback and several questions uh, that are actually uh, very interesting to, to take on. Um, I would like to point everyone's attention that we have the, uh, the paper that Dr. Amrud is referring to in the handout section, so you can have a copy uh, of the paper. Uh, before we go into q and A, I I would like Ahmed uh, to jump in and do one more poll. Ahmed? Sure. So I would like to know if uh, how many people actually here own an EV, or planning to own an EV in the future, or they're not planning to own an EV at all, and just using shared mobility and public transit, or just keep using your ICA. Then the combustion engine vehicle. Very good. You see, a lot most of the people are actually intending to purchase an AV in the next two and five years. I think we need to accelerate this a little bit, maybe. Okay, so I'm going to share the results. Let's see. Okay, so we have 42% of the audience here. Uh, intending to purchase an EV in the next two and five years. We have 21 intent to purchase in the next one, two years, which is very good. 20% are not interested and they will continue to purchase uh, ICE. 12% well, uh, are not planning to buy any more vehicles, but just using shared mobility and public transit. And the rest are, uh, already own an EV. We have 6% of the audience now who already have their own EVs, which is very good. Okay. Um, I think the 12% is very interesting on people relying or planning to rely on shared mobility. And uh, just for reference, the Middle East is expected to have, uh, doesn't sound good, it's, it, but the Middle East is expected, GCC in specific, expected to have the lowest rate of deployment of EVs compared to the rest of the world. Ahmed, how many polls do we have more? Do we have one more or are we done? Yes, we have one more. Should we launch it? Go ahead, do it. Yeah, then we'll do Q&A. Okay, it's actually, I think it's uh, very relevant to this. So based on uh, what you think so far and your previous knowledge as well, what do you think is the biggest challenge for EVs in Saudi Arabia, which I think is also very similar to the rest of the region. So we have lack of infrastructure, EVs are really expensive, the range anxiety, do you think the technology is not helping enough, or the regulatory framework? Okay, I think this one is. Okay. 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 Launch results. We have six, 36 percent of the audience think it's the lack of the infrastructure. 16 percent think EVs are expensive. It's actually interesting because EVs are expensive. I don't know which EV models are already existing in Saudi. So I assume people are most likely referring to importing EVs to Saudi. 
which makes it even more expensive. It's 21% think it's range anxiety, which I think this one it's, uh, needs a little bit more, more awareness because it's not actually. 26% uh, think it's the regulatory framework, which is a key factor, actually. Yep. All right, uh, very well. Um, now, just to start the, uh, the Q&A uh, segment uh, with Dr. Amro, I would like to point out that the topic of the paper is very specific because we have several questions that talk about uh, the readiness of the infrastructure and uh, the logic behind deployment scenarios or what have you. Really, the, the, the topic of the paper is very specific, looking at the uh, emissions associated with EV deployment, as well as or comparing that against the emissions impact on the generation mix. Dr. Amro, one question just to clarify. When we speak of emissions, we're not talking about air pollutants, or are we talking CO2 only? Uh, yes. Uh, in our analysis, uh, we restricted uh, the emissions to carbon uh, dioxide only. So we did not consider SOx or NOxes or particulate matter. Uh, that just uh, would have made the, the, the study a little bit bigger. And we just really wanted to, to focus on CO2. So the, the, the um, study was restricted on uh, CO2 emissions only and did not consider SOxes or NOxes or other uh, pollutants. Very well. Now. Uh, speaking as a clean energy enthusiast, I was hoping that your final slide will be EVs will change the world and will help any scenario of deployment possible, be it on the uh, uptake side on users or the energy mix. But I understand that uh, there are different scenarios and in general, it's a positive thing. But I want take away maybe to simplify it, deploying EVs even at a high percentage when you have a very polluted source of energy is not a good thing, obviously, as we all know. And really, deploying of EV has to come in with, with uh, decarbonizing the, the energy mix. Uh, speaking of that, because there was a couple of questions that came on, on to this, we're talking about scenarios of EV deployment, but are we taking into account the energy mix plan for Saudi Arabia? Or what energy mix have you considered in your study? Uh, Excellent. So, a very good question. So, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, the, the, um, the study um, uh, was for the 2017 uh, scenario. Um, and as you know, of course, as a research center, uh, we, we try to be as objective as possible. We try to be as, as you know, technology agnostic as possible with, with no biases. So the study quantified the question of what the current scenario would be. Uh, we did not discuss what future scenarios uh, are going to uh, hold for us. Now, uh, of course, uh, when the marginal generator in the coming five years or in the coming 10 years, I, I'm sure that most of the audience have um, uh, heard uh, His Royal Highness Prince Abdul Aziz bin Salman, our chairman and the energy minister in Saudi Arabia. He has explicitly mentioned last week in the um, future investment uh, initiative, if I remember correctly, that the energy mix in the kingdom uh, by 2030 is going to be uh, satisfied by 50% of renewables. Uh, uh, so imagine 50 percent of renewables in the mix satisfying the load so what will happen then is that most of your marginal generators are going to become uh, carbon free uh, in, in such a scenario all the charging for EVs will also be coming from a carbon free technology which means that uh, a significant part of the pollution that is uh, generated by the power sector will no longer be produced so, uh, and if uh, the, the same applies to life cycle assessments, if you look at the studies that uh, talk about the emissions that are associated with the complete life cycle of EVs. So from the mining, uh, all, all the way to the manufacturing of the batteries, to shipping the batteries, uh, to, uh, to, to the car, to the, to the age, to the using uh, of the usage of the car on the road and the uh, um, uh, attrition or, or basically scrapping the car. If you look at this whole value chain, a lot of it is, you know, uh, there's a significant attention to the life on the road uh, because this is where most of the emissions uh, would stem from. So um, the, the next, so to answer your question, what are we looking at? Currently, this is what the result would be. In the future, if you will have a significant renewable share in your power mix, your marginal generator becomes carbon-free and that 
makes the case from a, car from a carbon emissions perspective stronger for EVs. Very well, very well. And I think this would change the numbers drastically in that regard. If you fast forward to 2030 with 50% clean energy in the energy mix, any scenario of EV deployment would be net positive, obviously, on the transport sector and the clean energy sector, obviously, on the generation side. Absolutely. If, for example, if you have a significant amount of solar, significant amount of wind, significant amount of CSP, uh, and of course, when you have significant amount of renewables, you know, with the advancements happening in storage, you would assume that storage is, go is also going to be big. So it, it means that probably gas is going to be serving your base load and renewables, yeah. this nice assortment of renewables being the a marginal generator, in such a case, you don't need a model in the first place because sure. you know for sure. a fact that the marginal generator is uh, your renewables, yeah. so there will be no need for a model in the first place. Can we, because uh, I'm getting a lot of questions about people a little bit maybe surprised saying you made the statement that if you're not careful, you can be getting into a scenario where there's a net increase of emissions. Can we describe that scenario? What would be yes. a scenario? If we take the energy mix of Saudi Arabia today, I don't know, 60% gas and the rest liquids pretty much. Um, what would be a bad scenario from an emission standpoint in terms of EV deployment? Just right. Simply yes. Speak. The, yes. So the, the bad scenario, as I said, it's not necessarily a realistic scenario, but it is the very, you know, the dark uh, future being as pessimistic as possible, which is what? Which is, for example, taking all the four cylinder cars, all, of course, I, I don't want to be naming any specific cars, but, you know, your smallest uh, uh, engine size, you know, a 1.2 liter or 1.4 liter uh, car, four cylinders, very efficient, can give you, you know, uh, a lot of mileage from a very small fuel tank. Re retiring all these very efficient four cylinder cars or the four cylinder ICE vehicles, replacing them with the least um, uh, efficient EVs. So the, the EVs that require uh, 0 0.20, 0 0.22 kilowatt hours per kilometer. So uh, the, the driving, the kilometers that are, that are taking place through the ICE vehicle is happening with a very efficient uh, four-cylinder car. You're removing that and buying a very lavish EV uh, uh, that requires a significant amount of kilowatt hours compared to an efficient EV. And making sure that the marginal generator in most of the charging scenarios is happening when the liquid... Uh, uh, generators or liquid fuels are providing the energy. So when your marginal generator is liquid fuels. So if that happens, which is the extreme case, then uh, the, the model tells us based on our assumptions that uh, the uh, net emissions would increase rather than decrease. Very well, very well. What do you think the role of hydrogen can play in this? Would, does hydrogen have a role of reducing the carbon footprint of the transport sector in Saudi? Now or in the near future? Yes, so, so of course, uh, hydrogen has been available for some time. Uh, there has been a renewed interest in uh, green hydrogen. Of course, so blue, and, blue hydrogen and, and gray hydrogen has probably been around and has been discussed. Of course, right now there is uh, much more interest in green hydrogen. So generating hydrogen through uh, renewables only. And um, my answer would be not only restricted to EVs, I think hydrogen has potential to be used in, in, in much more than, than EVs. It could be playing a role in, in electrifying industries. Uh, it could be playing a role also in, in providing heat, not, not necessarily um, uh, electricity only, on, on various sectors, so in the building sector, in the EV sector, in the industrial sector. So, but of course, what that means is that you need significantly more uh, uh, renewables as well. Uh, so will it have a role? It does have a role. I think just like most technologies that are relatively new, uh, the cost is an issue, but uh, we've seen uh, cost reductions in solar, we've seen cost reductions in uh, wind, we've seen cost reductions in uh, storage. Uh, it, it is not too far-fetched to assume that green hydrogen will also continue to uh, witness cost reductions and be a player in not only the transportation sector, but other sectors as well. Very well, very well. Um, there is a comment made on the 
should we consider or what could be the role of hybrid hybrid vehicles? Uh, you know, there is a discussion, you know, if you look at EV uh, deployment globally, it has really been somewhat flat to slowing down in the last couple of years. And we have COVID now happening for the last few months. So that's really um, skewing the results. But there is debate that, you know what, maybe we don't need to jump over or wait for EVs to drop to in price to a level where they become widely adopted. We can today with hybrids, we can achieve 80% of the uh, reduction in emissions possible. Um, do you agree with that statement? And it's, it's within an affordable price even today somewhat. Uh, uh, to be honest, Dr. Raid, I, 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 um, I, I don't know the answer to your question. I, I don't consider myself an EV expert. I don't consider myself a hybrid expert. Um, I, I know that there are challenges, um, but I, 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 I don't think I'm in a position where I can really tell what the role of hybrids would be. I, I don't think I'm uh, the right person to be asking. Uh, I think I know enough to... to um, uh, address the emissions issue and its relationship and its interaction with uh, the power sector. But in terms of the consumer behavior, in terms of adoptions regarding uh, hybrids, their costs, uh, what are projected, I think other experts in the field will be uh, more suitable to answer this question. I, I, I don't no. think I can be... Uh, no, no, fair enough. Fair enough. I think it's, it's a valid point. I mean, uh, hybrids can have a, a big role to play and there is a point as well on the cafe standards, I mean, internal combustion uh, engine vehicles are getting cleaner as it is. And I think it's important to look at it from a total system carbon generation, whether it be it on the carbon on the energy that you're putting out of the grid or the carbon generating front driving the vehicles on the road. Absolutely. The, the problem with, with, which I see and we've also seen and we, we've seen the new Mazda, for example, uh, the EVs are, are competing with a moving target the efficiencies that are being gained and attained in the ICE industry uh, are significant. And the, the, the interesting thing is efficiencies are not only restricted to the four-stroke engine. Efficiencies can be attained through uh, gear ratios. The efficiencies can be get in the powertrain. I mean, there's a, several uh, uh, small pieces where it can, you know, collectively you can enhance the efficiency somewhat. So th yeah. that makes the, the, the role of, of EVs a little more difficult because it's not a it's, it's not a you know static target it is a moving target true true now dr amro you've mentioned and this study is not looking at any life cycle assessment can you talk a little bit more what would you define if this was looking at life cycle assessment what factors do you think would come into play in a sense or in a way that can have an impact um, end of life for batteries or what would you consider in the life cycle assessment in this case yeah, this, this is an excellent question, and it's, it's a valid question that is, is generally asked. So, um, you know, there are dozens and dozens, hundreds of, of life cycle studies that, that look into carbon emissions related uh, to uh, the, the complete life cycle of EVs. Um, so, of course, ideally, uh, you would like the complete value chain of EVs um, to be as efficient as possible, to be as low emitting as possible starting from you know the mining of the material uh the processing of the material shipping of the material manufacturing the batteries manufacturing the cars manufacturing the the, the cells shipping those cars to the, the place where they're going to be used the energy mix that's going to be providing the energy and the attrition of the car or no scrapping the car or the end when the car basically so from cradle to grave basically as, as they say from and all the, the the nice terminologies that EV folks use, you know, cradle to cradle and, and crave and, and uh, well to wheel, etc. Now, of course, uh, some countries um, uh, basically do not have access to the complete life cycle of of the the, the 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 vehicle. So, some countries, for example, do not have the mines for the material, do not intend to establish a manufacturing facility for cells do not uh, intend to establish an industry, for example, for EVs or cells. However, in the value chain, the uh, segment that concerns them and the segment that is under their circle of influence is when the car is on the road. 
this is what they can do. This is the only thing that they contribute in, whether they don't have industry, whether they don't have the know-how, or whether they don't have the funds to establish an industry, whatever the, the reason may be. What they can use of the technology is the, the segment of using them on the road. Why do we uh, criticize this country where, okay, I can't manufacture the car, I can't manufacture the cells, but I can use them efficiently. I have 50% hydro, for example. So, so I, I can use the EVs within my circle of influence and reduce the emissions in my segment. And this is exactly what life cycle assessments do. They look at the emissions at the mining field, at the manufacturing, at the shipping, and on the road, and the attrition of the car. And we know that if, if, I mean, I can be very efficient in many aspects, but if I'm extremely inefficient uh, during the 10 years of, of the life of the car, well, then maybe the efficiency at the mining segment and at the manufacturing segment, segment won't matter anymore. Because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing in the road when the car is on the road segment. So uh, I don't see that as a valid criticism. Yes, of course, you have to look at the life cycle of the complete value chain uh, uh, of the EV, but this is in not any, I don't think it is fair to criticize those who can only focus on a certain uh, segment in the value chain and be as efficient as possible in what they do. I, I think this is unjust. Very well, very well. I mean, the topic of EVs is generally, uh somewhat sensitive we need to try to discuss it in terms of uh you know the economics of old oil and gas countries like the gcc and saudi arabia but it's uh, there is and there are debates on both sides of the aisle obviously there are people saying it's a wave that's coming we cannot slow it down we might as well find a way how do we maximize the value of electric vehicles and some are just trying to ignore it and i guess some trying to fight it but i think the uh, that percentage is probably uh, shrinking, looking at the uh, success of companies like Tesla and others. Um, can you give us, I mean, the topic is important, obviously. How do you see, um, who is working on policy regarding electric vehicles? Is CAPSARC has looking at EVs from different perspectives as well? Or is this the only paper done by CAPSARC on EVs? Uh, the the, the answer to future work as well. Yes, yeah. please. So, so, so the answer is no. Actually, there is a, a, a very recent uh, a paper or a small commentary that was uh, uh, published by a colleague of mine that also um, uh, wanted to um, aim to assess the number of, of uh, the, the vehicles on the road in the kingdom. Uh, we have a transportation uh, initiative in Capshark looking at EVs. Um, uh, in different parts of the world, so um, um, discussing policies, discussing uh, consumers and their behavior towards EVs and uh, what makes them buy EVs and what makes them not buy EVs. Um, I know for a fact that many um, stakeholders in the kingdom, including the ministry and including SEC as well, they are uh, incorporating into their planning and into their studies the impacts of uh, EVs, also the uh, Ministry of uh, Trade as well, I think, uh, Ministry of Commerce. So uh, I think they are looking at uh, uh, EVs and it's, it's, a, it's a, um, a field or, or, or a topic that is taken or receiving attention along with other uh, technologies that might be also uh, entering the market soon. So, th so the answer is yes, I know that many Saudi stakeholder organizations are also looking at EVs. Um, I'm very glad to hear that. I think uh, this falls under the uh, value of trying to capture the uh, the wave as it happens in terms of the uh, capturing the economics of the energy transition. Um, with that, um, I think we're uh, our hour is up. Dr. Amber Shorafa, I'd like to thank you for your time, for your work, and for your contribution. I would like to thank our audience, and uh, yeah, hope to see you next time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Raed. Happy to be uh, participating in the workshop and thanks to Ahmed for being uh, so helpful and thank you for the audience and I hope it was insightful. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.